Good morning, church. How are you this morning? I'm so glad everyone could make it. Are you ready to worship the Lord this morning? Are you ready to praise Him? Uh, let's stand and let's just go back and let's do a song I know everyone will know.
of your time because I know that we're all anticipating not only WMUZ's finest, Yay. all right, but the Word of God says that it is, it is our job 
to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Amen. And how many know that times have been changing pretty rapidly oh, lately? My, my, my. And so part of my job and my responsibility to the, to the congregation is to give them the best tools that they can have to be able to talk to somebody who either is not a believer or has a different form of Jesus that they want to worship. And it's our job to equip you. So I thought, you know what, there is no better person in this area to speak about this to you than Bob Duco. So let's give Bob Duco a hand. You know, Pastor Rossi, he asked me, uh, hey, can you come out and speak? And I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to. He said, it's going to be a potluck afterward. And I was like, well, you know, if that's where the Lord leads me. Then it's not me. Anyway, uh, I appreciate you folks coming out. It's so great to, to see you and spend this morning with you. And you know, we're going to be talking this morning about counterfeit Christianity and the reinventing of Jesus. Because i got to be honest with you, this is a cancer that is spreading through the yes. body of Christ right now. And we need to be aware of this. Our competition, if I can call it that, I was just saying this to Pastor a little bit earlier, our competition used to be Hollywood and the atheists and the secularists. And you know who our competition is now? It's the church across the street. Yeah. Yeah. It's the so-called body of Christ that isn't saying let's do away with Christianity. They're saying let's re let's change it. Let's let's re let's redefine it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's turn it into something that's not biblical. And right. you know, it occurs to me Jesus told us what it was going to be like before he returned. <laughs> right? He said it'll be as it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the Sodom and Gomorrah's referencing, as it was in the days of Noah. But he also said when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith? And so there's supposed to be this kind of falling away, if you will. We're supposed to be being sifted down to a remnant. So on one hand, let's not get discouraged about this because this is what our Lord told us was going to happen. But you know something? We need, we need members of the body of Christ who are willing to be oak trees in a tornado and say we will not bend we will not take on the flavor of the world around us. We will, in fact, flavor the world around us. Amen. Unfortunately, the church, and we know this, we see it all the time, the church has taken on the flavor of culture. And we're doing everything we can to sanitize the gospel to make it somehow palatable to an unbelieving world. And this is happening all over. And i got to tell you, that's what's popular these days. That's what sells, just yeah. so you know. And trust me, with my show, look, I'm, I'm very thankful my show does well. They call it the number one uh, Christian radio show in Michigan. That's great. One of the top in the country. Okay, that's great. Can I tell you something? My audience could explode to be a lot bigger than it is if I would just water down the gospel and make it a little bit more friendly for an unbelieving world. But the truth is... I'm going to keep on proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. There is a heaven, there is a hell. And if you don't like it, take it up with God's Word because that's what it says there. You know, I had somebody call into my show one time and they said, uh, you know, Bob, here you are 20-some years later and you're, you're still saying the same stuff. <laughs> Salvation through Jesus Christ and His shed blood. The Bible's the authoritative Word of God. There is a heaven. There is a hell. You're going to go to one of those two places. You do realize, this is what the caller said to me, you do realize, Bob, this is Christian radio. Okay, this isn't secular radio. It's Christian radio. You're preaching to the choir. And I told him, with all due respect, half the choir needs preaching to these days. <laughs> they really do. So, I, you know, I was thinking about this. I... I was jotting down some notes to myself. I was, I've been doing this show for 20, it'd be 23 years this fall. And I, I was thinking about some of the, the debates that I've had, because I've done a lot of debates on my show, and that's fine, I don't mind debating at all. But I was jotting down some of the people that I have debated. Like for example, a lot of the big atheists like A.C. Grayling, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, uh, Victor Stanger, the atheist astrophysicist, 
Victor Stanger and I, we debated the conservation of energy law and the first law of thermodynamics as it relates to the creation of the universe. Uh, I love debating these guys, these atheists. Uh, Dan Barker, Michael Shermer, American atheists, but also evolutionary scientists, the ACLU, Planned Parenthood, Bible skeptics, gay activists, Mormon and uh, uh, Je uh, Jehovah's Witness leaders, Islamic scholars, New Age spiritualists, I mean, you name it. And you know something? 20 years ago, 95% of everybody that I debated were people like this. 20 years ago. Today, right now, I'm not making this up, 95% of all the debates that I have are with pastors, with Bible scholars, with theologians, with Christian authors. Like, seriously, 95% of every debate that I have right now. And I think to myself, wait a minute. Am I saying something different? I, I'm really not. I'm the same Johnny One note that I that I was 20 years ago. So we need to recognize the body of Christ is changing around us. And what's happening here is Christianity is being redefined into something different than is scriptural. And I want to remind you, the idea of a of a counterfeit Christianity, that's not something brand new. That was going on 2,000 years ago, too. So I want to remind you of some places in Scripture that warn us about holding on to the truth and teaching a different Jesus, because Jesus can be counterfeited. Let's face it, the enemy is a master counterfeiter. This is what he does. He takes something God created and he perverts it in a way that looks like it's good, but it's really not. For example, uh, let's think about John 3.16. We all know that, right? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Everybody's heard that. But sometimes we forget what He goes on to say, what Jesus goes on to say in verse 18. He says, For whoever believes in Him, talking about Himself, for whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Uh -huh. 2 Corinthians 11 Starting in verse 3, the Apostle Paul, talking to the church of Corinth, says this, quote, For I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach to you, or you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or a different gospel than the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Sounds like today, doesn't it? In verse 13, Paul says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. There's a lot of churches out there masquerading as apostles of Christ because they're preaching a gospel that's a perverted gospel that's really no gospel at all, but it feels good and tastes good to an unbelieving world. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, Galatians. Chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Paul says, quote, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let it be eter eternally condemned. As we've said already, and I now say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. So it sounds to me that you can counterfeit the gospel of Jesus Christ. John 8, 24 says, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. This is Jesus. But then in verse 31, he goes on to say, If you hold on to my teachings then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Everybody's heard the famous, the truth will set you free. Atheists know the truth will set you free. Most people don't know the context of that is Jesus telling you, hold on to my teaching. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, don't let go of it. Don't let it slip through your fingers, and before you know it, you're following something different than I taught you. Yeah. <laughs> John 2, verse 9. It says, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teachings of Christ does not have God. 2 Timothy 4, starting in verse 3, says, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths, but you keep your head in all situations. And, and can I just say, I don't, I don't mean to pour syrup on your pancakes or pastor, but you guys need to appreciate a pastor who's willing to not compromise oh, with yes. God. Yes. I'm, just, I'm so tired of debating pastors. I'm like, what is going on with you? Do you know a survey was just taken, it just came out a couple of months ago. This is Pew Research that's the largest religious uh, surveying group in the country. And Pew Research conducted a poll asking people, first of all, that this first poll came out about four or five years ago, and then the second poll came out just a couple of months ago. The first poll asked self-described born-again Christians, is Jesus the only way to be saved, or can non-Christian religions also lead to eternal salvation? Now, this isn't a survey of all of America. This is a survey of people who describe themselves as born-again evangelical Christians. Guess what percentage of Christians said that non-Christian religions can also lead to eternal salvation? 57%. 57%. You see, if I ask you right now for a show of hands, hey, who believes you can get to heaven without accepting Jesus? Nobody's going to raise their hand because, let's face it, everybody's like, pastor's going to see you. Okay? So... But an anonymous telephone survey, yeah. the truth has a funny way of coming out, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so there, people tend to be a little bit more honest. 57%. Okay. Well, just a couple of months ago, Pew Research did this very same poll asking, do you have to accept Jesus to go to heaven, or can you earn heaven oh, by being oh. a good enough person? Mm -hmm. This survey was taken of senior pastors. Senior pastors. 35% said you don't really have to accept Jesus. You can earn your way into heaven by being a good enough person. Okay. This is what's going on in the body of Christ right now. We're so busy trying to make everybody feel good that we're forgetting that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And there is a real hell that people are going to go to if they don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is true. And God's Word doesn't change just because culture and society changes. So you need to understand something about about counterfeit. How many anybody ever, ever played Monopoly? Yeah. Okay. For for me, Monopoly is just like ugh, it's kind of it's fun, but let's face it, it's whoever gets lucky enough first time around the board a couple times to buy as many properties as you can, that gives you leverage to work against everybody okay. else. Yeah. Okay. But look at Monopoly money. Why is it? that monopoly money is not considered a danger or a threat to the government. Why don't they care if you have monopoly money? Because it's so different from the real thing, nobody's going to be fooled by it, right? True. However, if I were to show you a real, $20, a real counterfeit $20 bill, it's kind of an oxymoron, real <laughs> counterfeit. Okay, you know what I'm saying. Follow me here on this. If I show you an actual, professionally made, counterfeit $20 bill, the kind that the government will come after you for, why is that a danger and a threat? Because it's so close to the real thing that to the untrained eye, you can be fooled by it. And really, 99% of that counterfeit bill is the same as the real thing. It's just there's some areas that's slightly different that keeps it from being authentic. And you know what? That means a $20 bill that's counterfeit, that's not worth $19.90. It's worth nothing. No, that's right. It's, it, it's literally worthless. And that's what happens with this counterfeit Christianity today. There's a lot of truth that's spoken in the counterfeit Christianity movement today. But there's just enough spiritual poison that it completely ruins it. And I want you to think of it this way. If I if I baked you a couple of cakes, let's say I baked you a couple of cakes, and I've got two of the bowls and I'm putting all the ingredients in, right? Uh, there's milk, and there's water, and there's eggs, and there's flour. 
ladies, I don't know. Help me. Honey, help me. I don't know. Whatever goes, baking powder or soda, whatever. Okay, but you're putting all the ingredients in each one, okay? But then one of them, I also decided to pour in just a quarter cup of dog urine. Oh. And then I mix them all up, okay? And then I bake them both, and then I pull them out, and then I ask you, hey, which one do you want me to cut you a piece of? Does it matter which one I cut you a piece of cake from? Why? They both have true ingredients. They both have water and milk and eggs and sugar and all the good stuff, right? You're going to say, yeah, but one of them is ruined because it's poisoned with dog urine, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, don't you understand? This is what happens with counterfeit Christianity out there. They teach a lot of great things. Hey, love your neighbor and all that. But when it comes to salvation only through Jesus Christ, when it comes through the basic narrow dogmas of grandpa's religion, as they call it, they don't want to accept that anymore. Mm -hmm. They want something that's feel good. And that's the poison that ruins the whole thing. So this is what you need to understand about counterfeit. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to share with you some of the common characteristics of counterfeit Christianity. And I'm going to tell you right now, they pretty much all have the very same flavor that runs through it. And you know what that flavor is? Idolatry. Self. It's the idolatry of self. It's the worshiping of self. It's the desire to believe what makes me feel good and what makes sense to me. It's really about me at the core. That's the flavor that's running through counterfeit Christianity. Now, I'm going to give you this morning a bunch of characteristics of counterfeit Christianity. Some of the red flags to look for. But I want you to notice every single one of these red flags are somehow connected to me and my feelings. And that's really what runs through it. So as I prepare to give you this list, I, I want to start. I want to start by reminding you what Scripture says about the reason that we were created. Because the general theme of this discussion is, is it all about me or is it all about God? That's really the general theme of this. And if you want to avoid counterfeit Christianity then you need to recognize that our faith in God needs to be God-centered. It's about worshiping Him. It's not about God serving me. It's about me serving and worshiping God. We've got this backwards. Today, in our culture and society, it's all about how can you feed me? What can you yeah, give me? Exactly. It's my life, my happiness. That's what matters more than it. God wants me to be happy. This is counterfeit Christianity. Why were we created? We were created to worship God and to spend eternity with Him. That's why we were created. And I just want to read to you from Isaiah 43, starting in verse 5. It says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, Give them up, and to the south, Don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, and everyone who is called by my name, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, yes. Yes. whom I formed and made. Yes. God makes clear in His Word, He created us for yes. His glory. Yes. Amen. Not for our happiness, for His glory. Now, we're going to experience the fullness of joy in the Lord. We can in this life, and we certainly will in heaven. And when you have the fullness of joy, there is a happiness that comes with that. And we'll experience that for all of eternity. But it's not just about, it's not about this life. In uh, Isaiah, it goes on in verse 20 to say, The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my, cho uh, my chosen, the people I formed for myself. Yes. That, I may, yes. that they may proclaim my praise. So God made us for Himself yes. so that we can proclaim His, His praise. Yes. That's why we were created. And we have turned God into our heavenly vending machine. We have turned God into, into our servant. We've made Him our, quote, co-pilot. You know, and just a quick show of hands. When, it, when you get to heaven, you stand before the Lord. How many plan on saying to God when you first stand face to face with Him? How many of you are going to say to Him, 
Well done, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> Anybody planning on saying that to God? No? No. Then how about we stop treating him like he's our servant here? Yes. Amen. Yes. God, how can you use me? What can I what can I do to bring glory and honor to you? How can my life be used as a living sacrifice to you? It's about him. It's not about me. If we can turn that around somehow from where we are in our culture and society today and recognize we belong to Him. He doesn't belong to us. That's going to be a foundation that will help you weed out some of these counterfeit Christianity characteristics. Let me go through, through a few of them with you. First of all, uh, these are the red flags to look for. Any church, any teacher, any author, any pastor, anybody who waters down the authority of Scripture and starts trying to fit, twist Scripture to fit what feels good to people today. If you're twisting Scripture and you don't recognize the authority of God's Word, right there is your first warning flag. Yes. And can I just say on a side note, there's a lot of things in Scripture I'm passionate about. One of them has to be the whole creation-evolution debate. I'm going to tell you right now, Genesis, you can take it seriously and literally. Biblical creation is true. There really was an Adam and Eve. The account of Noah's Ark is true. All of that is true. And by the way, the earth is not 4.6 billion years old. The universe is not 13.8 billion years old. All of it was created about 6,000 years ago. And yes, in six literal 24-hour days of creation. And I just want you to know, not only does God's Word say that, science says that. The scientific evidence makes that clear. The problem is it's the scientific evidence that's censored from school science books and history yes. books. Yeah. Yes. But documented from the evolutionary scientists themselves. And they're like, well, we don't want people to know this stuff. But it's their own discoveries that they've admitted in their own peer-reviewed publications that are censored from the media and yep. censored from school science books. Right. And when you look at that information, you realize, wait a minute here. The scientific evidence actually backs up biblical creation. Mm -hmm. Maybe, just maybe, I can trust what Scripture says is true yes. instead of trying to rewrite it. What are some other common red flags? I addressed this before, but I want to remind you of this because it's so important. The narcissistic church. Anything that is me-focused. All right. What do I believe? I believe what makes sense to me. What feels right to me. What seems fair to me. God serves me. It's me, me, me. So you need to recognize that. If you're hearing about your happiness, you're like... Don't misunderstand me. It's not like God doesn't bless us and we don't pray for things and petition Him for things. And we're very thankful for the blessings that God's given yes, us, of course. Yes. But when that becomes a driving force of how can I have the happiness that I want in this life and God wants me to be happy, when that becomes your overriding theology, you need to recognize the red flag. Yep. Because you're getting sucked into counterfeit Christianity and you don't even realize that you're worshiping yourself in that worshiping God. Amen. So keep an eye out for that. Other common characteristics of counterfeit Christianity, it's very emotion driven. Now I'm not against emotion, okay? God created emotion. We have emotion, so I'm not anti-emotion, although my wife would say that I am. <laughs> she teases me sometimes. For me, everything is about, well, does this make logical sense? Okay, but is this logical? You know, and so she teases me sometimes saying that uh, our wedding vows, mine was live long and prosper. You know, it really wasn't. <laughs> but look, emotion is a good thing. It's created by God. Yeah. He created us as emotional beings. But we need to recognize sometimes our emotion lies to us. And sometimes we can feel things that are different than what it says in Scripture. Counterfeit Christianity says go with your feelings. That's what's true, what you feel. That's counterfeit Christianity. Because i got news for you. There are going to be things that you feel, genuinely feel, that will be confusing to you and seem to contradict Scripture. And there can be difficult. But look, I understand there's things about God that confuses us. You know something? He doesn't explain everything to us in detail. He doesn't give us all of the answers. He gives us enough answers that we're without, we're without excuse. But He doesn't give us all the answers. There are some things that He leaves us a little bit confused about. And personally, 
I, I can to me it makes sense that God would have done that on purpose because he wants to see a certain measure of faith on our part. To where he says, look, I've given you enough answers, but I'm not going to answer everything for you. I want to see if you will be willing to say, God, I see this in your word. This doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem just. That doesn't make sense to me. But you're my heavenly father, and I trust you, and I trust your word. He wants to see that we're willing to do that. Counterfeit Christianity doesn't do that. I'll twist a scripture to fit what makes sense to me. Here's another red flag of counterfeit Christianity. It bends over backwards to never offend. To never offend and never divide. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the light of Jesus Christ, newsflash, it's supposed to be an offense to a darkened world. <laughs> Counterfeit Christianity tries to remove the offense so that a non-believing world can go, hey, yeah, that looks pretty good to me. Now, again, I want to give a caveat here, okay? I'm not saying that we don't need to communicate with wisdom in ways that are going to reach people. I mean, Paul adjusted the, his communication style based on who he was talking to. But he never compromised the truth of Scripture. And so, I don't want to be divisive just for divisiveness' sake. But when it comes to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, better be to be divided even in your own home. I had a caller one time during Free For All Friday called in. He's not a believer, and he said, You know, Bob, according to your narrow, dogmatic, religious views, uh, all you do is divide people. And Jesus was not about division. Jesus was about peace. So I said to myself, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. I'm going to give you a quote, and you tell me who you think said this. Quote, Do not think I've come to bring peace. I have not come to bring peace. I come with a sword. I come yes. to divide a mother against a daughter, a son against a father. Who said that? Jesus. And he was like, Oh, was that Jesus? <laughs> it was. Okay. Not that he prefers division for division's sake. But when it comes to compromising truth, better to be divided even in your own home. We must stand on what is true. Counterfeit Christianity says, let's not be offensive and let's not divide people. Well, division is a good thing. Division separates truth from lies. We need division. We actually really do. Counterfeit Christianity says no. Another red flag of counterfeit Christianity? Political correctness. Okay. Uh, let's make sure we're political. This is all woven into the don't offend, don't be divisive kind of thing. You need to be culturally acceptable. That's counterfeit Christianity. Well, I got news for you. I'd much rather be biblically correct than politically correct all day long. And anybody who listens to my show, you know I'm about as far from political correctness as you can get. Okay? But I don't really care. Now, let me make sure and stress. That doesn't mean that we can't have people that we may disagree with on some political or cultural issues. Right? I, I'm not going to say any of these kind of issues are salvation issues. But I am going to challenge people on, on things that I believe and just make sure that anything in culture, society, lines up with the Word of God instead of compromising it. But we've got to be willing, we've got to be willing to take a little bit of the heat. We've got to be willing to go against the grain sometimes of society and culture. And that might mean losing some friends. That might mean not getting invited to you know, the next party. That might mean basically having some co-workers give you some stink eye and have a little bit of a disturbance in the force between you and some of your friends. Well, so be it. That doesn't mean we have to be offensive on purpose. But we can tell them, hey, look, you're my friend. I love you. I care about you. Let's watch the ball game together. Let's do all of that. But if you ask me to compromise what God's Word says, I'm just not going to do it. Right. You know. And if anything else, they should respect you for that. And if they don't, well, then that's on them. Here's another red flag of counterfeit Christianity. A minimizing or outright eliminating the reality of hell. I talked about hell a little bit earlier. Look, I know hell is not a popular thing to, to talk about. I get that. And I'm not saying that we should be 
obsessed with hell where everything is about hell. But you know something? If you are if you are sweetening up the gospel enough and sanitizing it so that you remove that uncomfortable discussion and reality of hell, then you're now altering the gospel itself. You are. Because Jesus saves us from something. Okay? He really does save us from hell. And this is something we have to be willing to talk about and preach. You know, it's interesting, if you read through the Gospels, just read the red letters of Jesus. Just only the red letters of Jesus, get a piece of paper, and write down all the times that he described what heaven's going to be like, and all the times he described what hell's going to be like. And you're going to be pretty shocked to find out he actually described the horrors of hell more often than he described the beauty of heaven. Because Jesus knows how real this is. This is very binary. When you die, you are either going to go to heaven or you are going to go to hell. And that's it. Once you're dead, your decision has been made for you. Which, by the way, that's another red flag of counterfeit Christianity, trying to write in a second chance after you die. Well, no. Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before men, that means here on this earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Whoever does not acknowledge me before men, I will not acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Wow. That's what Jesus said. He did not say, if you don't accept me here in this life, that's okay, you get a second chance after you die. Okay. He just didn't say that. But that feels more fair yeah. to a lot of people. <laughs> so what do they do? They twist Scripture to fit what feels right and fair to me. Right. You see, that's what I'm talking about when I say this, this theme of it's all about me and my feelings weaves through all of this counterfeit Christianity. What are some other common characteristics? A complete reduction, if not outright refusal to discuss some of the hard topics like sin, redemption, the blood, the cross, the, those kinds of things. We don't want to talk about that stuff anymore today because, as I said before, well, that's Grandpa's old narrow yeah. dogmatic religion. You know, Pastor, you've got to get with the times. People don't want to hear that old school stuff. That's Billy Graham from the 60s. That's not today. No, that's Jesus Christ from 2,000 years ago. And he doesn't change. That's right. So we've got to be willing to talk. And I'm not saying everything is like that. Every Sunday is like There are plenty of times where it's perfectly appropriate to talk about things in life and, and the, 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 the things that maybe bring us joy and how we should be living our lives and, and uplifting times. I'm all for encouraging times and encouraging talk. But when that's all you do, when that's all you focus on, that's when it starts getting problematic. You know, I, uh, I remember I, I caught some heat from some of my listeners who, because we were contacted by you know, Joel Osteen, probably the most famous pastor in America. And he'd written some new book or whatever, and, and he had asked if he could come on my show. And I was like, well, you know, okay. So I had him on the show. And there, look, I'm not trying to beat up on the man, but I was, uh, I had some listeners pretty upset with me because I asked him some tough questions. And I asked him about things like homosexuality and the, the kind of the feel good, our best life now. And I said, look, the title of your book is Our Best Life Now. Is it really about this life now, or is it about glorifying God and spending eternity with Him and worshiping Him? Thank you. And uh, and I, I brought up the, the the thing of of rebuking and saying the hard words. And I said, look, Pastor, I'm not going to say anything behind your back that I wouldn't say directly to you. And I just want you to know that I've been a critic of yours because. Uh, there, there's a lot to the gospel. But there's a lot of encouraging parts of the gospel, but there's also some tough truths that are part of the gospel. And it's like you leave that to the rest of us to carry the heavy water and be the lightning rods. And with all due respect, you seem to just preach the feel-good things that enhance your own popularity and leave the tough talk to the rest of us. And I just want to challenge you on that. And so, you know, I mean, it was nice. It was a cordial conversation. He's like, well, I know what you mean, Bob. <laughs> he said, but God has just called me to be an encourager. And I said, 
hasn't he called you to be a minister of the gospel of That's Jesus right. Christ? That's right. That's right. He says, well, Scripture says to encourage. I said, yes. I said, read that entire Scripture. You're, you're quoting Paul talking to Titus. What he said was, and Titus was a pastor, Paul said, encourage and rebuke with all authority. So you've got to be encouraging them, but the rebuking's got to be part of it. Well, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I backed off because it's like I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sit there, you know, browbeat the guy. Okay, but I'm just saying this is what we have to recognize: the gospel of Jesus Christ is supposed to have some offensive parts to it, of, to a non-believing world, and we've got to be willing to to acknowledge that. Some of the other things, some of the other red flags that are part of counterfeit Christianity, that all spiritual paths lead to God that different religions, there's beauty in different faith traditions. The Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists. I see beauty in these faith traditions. The important thing is that you have spirituality. The important thing is that you have faith. Okay, That is counterfeit. That is absolutely counterfeit. Because all spiritual paths do not lead to God. That's There's right. one way to God, and that's through Jesus Glory Christ. And God. Said, well, Glory God. That's it. And by the way, part of the uh, part of the, the, the feel good counterfeit Christianity is the the perverting of the word faith, yeah. because faith has been watered down into some kind of feel good. Well, the important thing is we have faith. I'm a person of faith. I have faith. <laughs> right. With all due respect. I don't care if you have faith in a general sense. I want to know what you have faith in. Oh, because that's what matters. Go. There you go. I, uh, I was interviewed. I don't know if you've heard of Mitch Album. Yeah. Very well-known yeah. author, okay? And he writes a lot of books on spiritual matter. Tuesdays with Maury was his biggest one he came out. And, and Mitch has been on my show a few times over the years. And, and so Mitch came out with, uh, Mitch came out with this book, this is a few years ago, called Have a Little Faith. It was a whole book about how important it is to have faith. Now, Mitch isn't a Christian. He doesn't profess to be a Christian. But he wrote a book about how important it is that we all have faith. So, Mitch contacted my producer and was like, hey, I'd like to come out to the station and be on Bob's show and interview with him here in the station. So, my producer asked, do you want you know, Mitch to come on? I said, well, alright, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to avoid asking him some tough questions. So anyway, so Mitch comes out to the station and, and we're sitting there and it's during commercial break before we go on. And it was interesting too. He was he was telling me how a lot of his family listens to my show. And I thought, oh, that's nice. You know, and sometimes my show will even be playing in his house. And I thought, oh, I appreciate that. And he's like, you know, it, it's amazing. He said, I've got a lot of Christians in my family and they're all trying to get me saved. <laughs> You know, and he said that I can go on, I can go on, t uh, whatever Larry King back when he was on, or I could go on any on CNN or ABC or NBC, or I can go on any of these shows, and nobody even cares. I can go on the Tonight Show, nobody even cares. He said, but for the last several days, I've been getting constant texts from family members. Is it true you're going on Bob Duco's show? Is it true you're going? On? <laughs> okay. Because they all want you to get me saved. <laughs> and uh, and I said, well, just so you know, Mitch, they are right. Okay? They really are right. You do need Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. Amen. That is true. Yes. And so I told him, I said, look, I'm going to interview about your book. And I said, for the most part, it'll be a soft interview. I'm not going to drag you into a debate. I said, but you do need to know it's not going to be all peaches and cream. There will be some tough questions I need to ask you. But I'm not going to drag you into a, a, a drag, drag out theological debate. And he goes, well, I appreciate that. And I said, but just don't expect it to be completely softball. And he said, okay, and that's fair. And so anyway, we get into the, to the interview and said, you know, your books have a little faith. Tell me about that. And he's like, well, I just think it's important that people have faith. As long as you have faith, that's a good thing. I said, it is. He said, yes. I said, okay, well, have you ever heard of these kind of religious cults where suicide cults, where the people end up taking cyanide pills or killing themselves to follow the cult leader? Yeah. He said, oh, yeah. And I said, would you agree that those people had faith? He goes, well, yeah. I said, was it good that they had faith? <laughs> well, no. I said, if a person falls out of an airplane and they have faith that, can, that they can fly, so they choose not to take a parachute, is that a good faith that they have? 
No. No. So, so in other words, faith is only good if it's faith in something that's true. Right. But if it's faith in something that's not true, it's actually bad to have faith then. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, yes. He's like, well, yeah, well, that, that's, that's, that's one way of looking at it. And I said, well, let's be honest. <laughs> okay? So if having faith in something that's not true is bad, now we have to determine what's true. And Mitch, Jesus Christ declared what is true. That only faith in him is true. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So what Jesus declared is that the only faith that's true is to have faith in him. Faith in anything else is false and a bad faith to have. And I can see he's squirming. He's like, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know what you're saying. I, you know, whatever. And so then I was like, all right, Mitch, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back off now. I got that out of my system. And so and then I went on and just had a soft one to do with him after that. But the point is, this is what's popular in counterfeit Christianity today. Feel good, generic terms of faith or truth. We all find we all find truth in different religions. I was debating somebody one time on my show about and this is kind of one of these counterfeit Christianity things that said all spiritual paths, you know, they lead to the same God because you have truth in different religions. You do, right? And and and, and there's a sense, this feeling, this belief. That if you're a good enough person, then somehow we can earn our way into heaven. And the, the, the fact is that's just not biblical. None of us are good enough to get into heaven that's on right. our own. None of us are. We are all deserving of hell. Every single one of us. But you see, that really doesn't sell in today's culture and society. <laughs> yeah. Because people want to believe, hey, I'm a good person, yeah. and therefore... I should qualify for heaven because after all, I've done more good deeds. My good deed, bad deed ratio is in balance, so therefore, I should get to heaven. You know what that is? That's Eastern religion karma is what you're believing in. That's a false religion. And it's a hard pill for some people to swallow in today's world and even in some counterfeit churches. The idea that no matter how good I am, no matter how nice I am, no matter how well I treat other people, I don't deserve heaven. And here's the analogy I've used on my show before, and I'll use it again with you this morning. I commonly use the analogy of two glasses of water. If I have two glasses of purified water sitting there, and in... And then let's say I have over here, remember my dog urine from before? Uh -huh. Okay. Oh. I know. You're like, wow, Pastor, you invite this guy. All I got to hear is about dog urine all day. So now I got my little dog urine over here. I, I'm finished baking the cake, and so now I got you two glasses of water. Let's say the dog urine represents sin. Let's just say it represents sin, okay? In one glass of water, I'm going to put a whole bunch of sin in there. I'm going to take a quarter of a cup. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And pour it in there and mix it all up. Oh, man, that's nasty. In the other glass of water, I'm just going to take an eyedropper and bloop, 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 just put five little drops in there and mix them up. Which one are you going to drink out of? Neither. Well, neither one? Yeah, but this one has just a... This one's so much better. This is so much better than this one. So much so... These are little white lie scents. This is the... No, you know what happens? They're both equally ruined, aren't they? And they both deserve to be poured down the same drain, don't they? Right? That's what you need to understand about sin. Ever since Adam, ever since the Garden of Eden, we are born into sin. Add to that the individual sins that we commit. And I don't care if you have five drops worth or a whole half a cup worth. The bottom line is we are all disqualified for heaven on our own. Well, that's why we need Jesus Christ, because we realize we're getting into heaven not on our own goodness, not on the cleanliness of our own water, but on His shed blood. Okay? On the perfection of who Jesus yes. Christ is. He's the ultimate reverse osmosis filter who wipes Amen. away all that sin. Yes. But that's what we need to recognize about going to heaven. It's not about being a good enough person. And there's a whole world of people out there that are going to go to hell because they think they're a nice enough person. And this cancerous belief is spreading its way through the church right now. So be careful of that. Be careful you don't fall for that. By the way, another common characteristic of counterfeit Christianity is, I just got to call it the way that it is, this whole LGBT, transgenderism, uh, gay and lesbian, and all that kind of stuff. 
Look, the individual people themselves, of course we love them. We love them with love of Christ. And is there forgiveness in Christ? Absolutely. And if you've got one guy here who's been struggling with pornography or lust his whole life, and another guy here who's been struggling with same-sex attraction his whole life, even if they've both fallen, even if they've both been messed up, even if they've both gone down these roads, if they're both walking in repentance and trying to trying to walk in obedience, then we need to equally embrace both of them and show both of them the love of Christ. And not say, you won't work with you, I can't relate to you. So let's be careful we don't go down that judgmental road. Yeah. But we cannot go to the other road, which is, if you're struggling in all these areas of sin, well, you need to walk in obedience. But if you have same-sex attraction, then that must be who God made you to be. No. And that that's who you are. And you have nothing to repent of. That's not true either. All right? Homosexuality is a sin. And I can't believe I haven't been handcuffed yet saying that, but the day is coming when I'm probably going to. My wife's like, hopefully you'll make it to retirement before that. <laughs> but I don't care. We have to be willing to declare things that are true. Okay? Homosexuality is sin, but it's not the worst sin. It's not the only sin. Okay, But you don't get to rewrite it as somehow non-sinful because it's so popular today. And can I just say, if a man believes that he's a woman... I'm not going to call him her and she. He is a man. He is a man who believes that he's a woman. He needs prayer. He needs counseling. He needs to be loved, absolutely. But he needs to not be enabled to believe a lie about how God created him. See, this is the body of Christ standing on the truth of what Scripture says. But everything that I've just said, especially in the last five minutes is extremely offensive to an unbelieving world. And these are areas that the church right now is compromising. We need to not compromise in this area. We need to be bold enough to, to speak the truth. Okay? Amen. I, uh, where, oh, where does the time go? Well, Pastor told me I had until 3 o'clock today. So. <laughs> kind of wind this down with a couple of final things. Uh, what, uh, okay, let me let me get the top ten proofs out of the way real quick. I was going to mention this and I forgot about it before, and so let me explain this. Uh, if you see the top ten proofs table in the back, you want to stop back there afterward and get some top ten proofs for yourself, go ahead. I'll be back here with my wife and with my assistant, Terry, and you can get some of these if you like. A lot of you are familiar with top ten proofs. Some of you have them. Some of you don't and don't know what they are, and it takes time to explain to people one at a time when they come to the table, here's what they are. So it's easier for me if I can just one time corporately explain what's back there, and then that way if you folks decide you want to get some, that's great. Top 10 proofs are they're audio recordings by me, audio studio recordings by me. And what I've done is I've taken 14 different topics that are some of the toughest topics that skeptics hit us with tough questions on. And I've done about 35 years worth of research into all of the scientific evidence, historical evidence, logical arguments, mathematical evidence, and everything to prove, logically left brain, what we believe as Christians is actually really true. Now, I'm not saying our faith is dependent upon logic, don't get me wrong. But I want people to know our faith is backed up by logic. And it's backed up by intellectual reasoning. It's backed up by the evidence. So the top ten proofs are all basically left-brain logical factual arguments to prove what we believe as Christians. And so there's 14 topics. Some of them are things like, you know, top ten proofs, evolution is scientifically impossible. And it goes through the documented, verified scientific discoveries in the fossil record, in the geologic strata, in radiometric dating, and all of that that is censored from school science books, school history books. And it's like, well, I didn't know this. I didn't know this. So like, one of them is top ten proofs dinosaurs lived with man. And that's right, went on Noah's Ark. Well, come on, Bob, didn't dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago? Nope. Dinosaurs were created 6,000 years ago on days five and six of creation by God. Yes, they went on Noah's Ark. They slowly went extinct over the next few thousand years after Noah's Ark. The last few remnants of dinosaurs not finally going to get extinct until just a few hundred years ago. And I know some people will think that sounds crazy. 
but the documented, verified evidence proves that to be true. Yeah. Stuff that, by the way, everything in those is public information. You don't have to take my word for it. You can look it all up yourself. Yeah. I've just done all the research for you and legwork for you, and I've just compiled them all together. But for example, you look at any history book in the public schools today, and you're not going to see anything about the recorded historical accounts of, of dinosaurs. But you know what? Pliny the Elder wrote about the dinosaurs that he saw. Marco Polo, in chapter 40 of his 1295 AD writing of the province named Carazon, chapter 40 is censored from all school history books about Marco Polo. You know why? Because Marco Polo described in chapter 40 the Tyrannosaurus Rex that he saw. Oh my. Okay? This is all a matter of, again, you don't have to take my word for it. Read the stuff for yourself, but you're never going to see it in your school books. The very same radiometric dating, potassium argon dating, that dates the Earth to be 4.6 billion years old, also dates the Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980 is happening 2.8 million years ago. <laughs> I document the actual evolutionary dating laboratories that confirm this. There is just so much stuff that we have been lied to about. So there's top ten proofs the Bible is true. Top ten proofs evolution is scientifically impossible. Top ten proofs for God's existence. Going into mathematics, laws of physics. Uh, there's top ten proofs for America's Christian heritage. I mean, you name it. There's just about every topic you can imagine in there. You can go back and you can see what all the 14 topics are. To One's on the resurrection itself. And one's even on ghosts, UFOs, and the paranormal. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, abortion, homosexuality. Just about everything. It's all back there. And I want you to remember, I've recorded all of these in very simple layman's terms, fifth grade language. The idea is to be like C. Dick and Jane Run, to make it real easy for people to understand. And so each topic has the 10 best arguments, the 10 best proofs to prove. Here's the 10 best arguments to prove evolution is false and creation is true. 10 best arguments to prove God exists. 10 best proofs to Prove Christianity is the only truth and all other religions are false. And just 10 best proofs of all of them with the documented evidence to back it up. That's what the top 10 proofs are. Now, if you have the top 10 proofs already, I came out with them originally 16 years ago. All right? uh, if you have the originals, that's great, but they're like 16 years old and they're all revised and updated now. And you'd be amazed how much new information there is. So if you've got the originals, I don't mind telling you, you've got to get the new ones. You're going to be amazed how much new stuff is in there. Uh, here's how much they cost. You can get them in CDs if you want. And like some of them are four-disc topics. This is the one on evolution. It's a four-disc topic. Some, copy, some topics are three-disc. Some topics are two-disc. And the prices vary from 30 bucks to 25 bucks to 20 bucks, depending on the topic. All right? Uh, if you get all 14 topics in the series, that's 37 discs total. And just to give you an idea, they individually add up to like $325. But if you get the complete series, we discount the whole thing down from $325 down to $229. And it comes in a nice display case. You've got all 14 topics there. You can listen to them, give them to friends, do whatever you want to do. We have been running a sale on the website, and I've been mentioning this on the show, so obviously the same thing would apply here. We've been doing 25% off everything, just because inflation is so high and it's hurting people. So now you take that 229, you lop to another 25% off of that, and so now I think you're down to like 171 bucks or something for all 14 topics of the complete series. Now if you don't want CDs, because you're like, oh, that's so old school. Okay, well, <laughs> we do have flash drives, okay? We've got flash drives back there, too. This has all 47 hours of all 14 topics on there. And the flash drives are discounted from 300-some bucks down to, I think it's $179. But now the $179 with 25% off comes down to like 130 or so, all right? So figure you're looking at about 130 bucks, you're going to get the entire series on this. And figure you're looking at 170 bucks or so if you want to get the whole series on this. And if you do want to get both, figure 170 something plus 130 something, forget that. The whole thing is just 186 for both. So it's like 15 bucks more you can get this. So my suggestion is get both of them. That way you got both. You got it on your computer, flash drives, give it to people, and that kind of thing. It's entirely up to you, but come on back there. Even if you don't want to get anything, just come back and say hi. Okay? 
Uh, and yes, we take credit card, checks, cash, all that kind of stuff. So uh, come on back there, and I look forward to meeting your folks afterward. Um, let me uh, let me close up with this. When we talk about counterfeit Christianity and preaching the truth, I, I want to tell you very quickly, and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this now. How many of you have ever heard of a lady by the name of Mary Ann Williamson? Does that name ring a bell? Yeah, she's actually be. running for president right now. As a Democrat, she's running for president. She's considered the the spiritual guru to Hollywood. <laughs> she's extremely popular with Hollywood, and she preached this kind of New Age uh, universalism, Unitarianism kind of, hey, all spiritual paths lead to God. She's very popular. And a lot of pastors let her speak in her churches. I can promise you Pastor Rusty would not, but there's a lot of pastors. <laughs> and she, for example, she is best friends with Oprah Winfrey and so Oprah Winfrey's book club and she's written several number one New York Times best-selling books and they're all on spirituality and she claims that she's preaching Jesus and the love of Jesus so anyway long time ago I'm, uh, it's at night and I'm flipping through the channels and and I see she's being interviewed on CNN and she's talking about Jesus said this and Jesus said that and I'm like okay so I flip her and there's some cable channel there's a church that sure enough has Marianne Williamson preaching from the church. And they're like, you can get her books in our bookstore. So I get on my show the next day, right? And I'm just, I'm tearing into this. And I'm like, look, Marianne Williamson is a false teacher. She's not preaching the Jesus of the Bible. She's preaching a different Jesus, a false Jesus. And I don't want you to buy her books. And I don't want pastors to invite her into their pulpits. So I'm saying this on my show, right? While I'm saying this, my producer says into my headphone, uh, Marianne Williamson's on the phone. Oh, 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 oh. True story. Oh, wow. So, wow. me, ever being the coward to shy away from no, controversy, no. I'm like, oh, put her through. Yeah. So she goes on, she's like, she's like Mom, she says, I I'm listening to you just talking this way about me, and I don't understand, you know, I, I like you, I don't know why you don't like me. <laughs> and I said, well, Marianne, it's not that I don't like you, I don't know you. You might be a nice person, but I won't say anything behind your back that I won't say to you directly. You You're teaching falsehoods, you're teaching a false Jesus, I don't want people to buy your books. You don't teach the true <laughs> Jesus of the Bible. And she said, well, we all find our own truth. And I said, no, we all find our own opinion. The truth is in God's Word. And you're not preaching the true Jesus. Yeah. Wow. So she said, well, yes, I am because I love Jesus. And I, I said, I'll tell you what then, Miriam. Would you agree to come in studio with me sometime and let's spend an hour on my show live debating who Jesus really is and what he really taught? Would you be willing to do that? And she said, yes. Okay. So it's a couple weeks later. She comes to the station and we're in studio together. And it starts out easy enough. And then... About a half hour into it, I started asking her some tough questions. And I started challenging her in Jesus being the only way. And she said, well, you know, we will all find different spiritual paths to God. I said, what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one yes. comes to the Father but by me. Amen. So what do you think that means? And she says, well, you know, different people interpret Scripture different ways. I said, you tell me how to interpret that other than he's the only way. That's right. And then she said, well, what Jesus was saying is that we all have this attuned consciousness that unites with the cosmic universal consciousness of Christ within us all. Who in? I go, stop, Marianne. Jesus didn't say any of that New Age nonsense. And so we go to commercial break, and we have about a half an hour to go still, because now I'm cracking my knuckles. I'm really getting ready to... Because I usually start out easy, and then it's like, okay, now it's going to start getting tough. During the commercial break, she says, Bob, I'm sorry, I completely forgot I have an appointment I have to go. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, so, no, I'm sorry, I, I just, I really forgot, you know, I said, Mary Ann, let's be honest, the kitchen started getting a little bit hot, and now you're getting out of the kitchen, let's be honest. She says, no, no, really, I just, I, I wish I could stay, I really wish I could, and I said, oh, all right. 
So, so during the commercial break, you know, so we stand up, her and her assistant, we stand up and we shake hands, and she's like, okay, but you have to give me a hug so I know you're not mad at me. <laughs> okay, Marianne. So, so they leave. Well, anyway, her assistant calls back after the show and said, you know, Marianne felt really bad, and she wants to know if, if she could take you to dinner. And I was like, well, if you're going to be there too, you know, the three of us kind of thing. And so, okay, so the three of us go to dinner. Uh, that night, and we sat in this restaurant, and Marianne and I just went back and forth about the truth of who Jesus Christ really is and what Scripture really says for six hours, from six o'clock until midnight. Uh, five, the restaurant closed at eleven. It was like midnight, and they were like, oh, "You guys are going to have to leave now." Okay. Uh, I'd love to tell you that Marianne Williamson dropped her knees and accepted Jesus Christ, the true Jesus of Scripture, uh, of Scripture at the end. I mean, that didn't happen. All we can do is plant seeds and let the Holy Spirit do His work. Yes. But I can tell you, for six hours, she had a couple of wheelbarrows full of seeds. <laughs> okay. We'll see what the Holy Spirit does with her. But I just want you to understand, that kind of teaching, the unity, Unitarian, uh, all that kind of nonsense, and all spiritual paths lead, and the feel-good kind of stuff, and what's culturally acceptable, this is what sells, this is what feels good. And I hate to say this, but when you see empty seats in church, that's where a lot of people are going. Because it makes them feel better. We need to be the watchman on the wall and stand on the truth of what Scripture says. And allow ourselves to be sifted to a remnant. Okay? So, anyway, I appreciate you folks having me out. I do. And I just want to encourage also, if you get the top ten proofs, yeah, just do me a favor. If you do get them, listen to them. Don't stick them in a drawer somewhere. And then it's, I want you to become walking encyclopedias yeah. so that whenever your friends or family or coworkers says, oh, yeah, how do you explain this? I want you to go, actually, that's pretty easy, and rattle off the answers. I'm telling you, you listen to these, you're going to be amazed after a few months' time how much of a walking encyclopedia you become and able to answer the tough questions. That's what we need to do. We need to stand on the authority of God's Word. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given us. God, we do realize that we're blessed beyond measure. But Father, we ask that you help us to see that it's not about us and how blessed we may be. But Lord, teach us to make it about you. Turn our hearts around, Lord, so that we would lift you up, so we would exalt you, so that we would see our lives as a living sacrifice to you. Help us, God, to exalt you in everything that we do. Help us, Lord, to be strong and courageous and bold, to stand on the truth of your word. Give us the strength and the wisdom, Lord, to go against the grain of our culture today. And Lord, give us the boldness to wear our faith in you on our sleeves as we're instructed to in your word. And God, we just ask that everything that we do and say would be to bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.